Hello and welcome everyone to the Rangers Journal. My name is Billy Rankin. I'm pleased to be your host this evening. Um, we have a, a really interesting episode, actually. Um, you're going to like it. Let me introduce my panellists, our co-panellists this evening. Uh, Dino, I'll come to you first. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, Billy, mate. How are you? I guess I'm okay. It's after a win, you can relax for a few days. We've got another few days for the game. So, yeah, feeling, uh, feeling the sunshine, even though it's not quite sunshine at the moment. Uh, also, um, Scott, how are you doing, Scotty? I ain't no bad at all, mate. No bad at all. It's very good to go and speak about your angels. Of course it is. And Tomo, thank you again for coming on. How are you? Not a problem, yeah. I'm good, mate. Good bank holiday weekend. Rangers won, kept the mood up. Didn't ruin it by dropping silly points. So, uh, yeah, happy days. I'll stay with you just as a, a general overview. How do you feel the game went? We're going to discuss it in more detail, but you're just yeah. your general thoughts. Thought we played well in patches. Um, thought we could play 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 better, but um, Hibs came out and actually tried to play football, which suited us. And uh, yeah, it was nice to get three good goals and uh, a good win, and hopefully no injuries. And Dean, yourself, how are you feeling after the game? How do you feel it went? You're muted, mate. Sorry. Sorry, mate. Uh, it was exactly as I anticipated it to be. Um, pretty, pretty scrappy game, um, and we've come out on top. So I, and um, the, obviously the refereeing was as everybody anticipated. So I can't wait to get in and about it and uh, talk about it in more detail, mate. Well, that's, uh, I never asked you to mention the refereeing performance, but it leads me nicely into something that Scott's arranged for us. Scott, you to tell us you reached out to a, a qualified referee. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, I, I sure did. I'm not sure if my camera's frozen, boys. It looks as if I had it. It is frozen, yeah. Very right, okay. I'll get it sorted once I play the clip. So um, I reached out to a friend of mine who used to be a referee for the SFA, and he put me in touch with Gary, who has kindly agreed to come on board. Gary's a an official licensed referee for the SFA and he's just going to come on and be quite non-biased with the uh, with the content regarding Rangers refereeing decisions and it allows us to kind of pick it apart going forward. Well that's great. If you don't mind the play the first um these first appearance thanks cast with well, we have um, Gary on board, who's going to be able to give us some refereeing analysis on some of the decisions. Um, Gary, just want to introduce yourself. How are you doing? How are you doing, guys? I'm um, pleased to join the team. I'm Gary. I'm a current SFA ref and linesman. I watch so much football shows and so many uninformed or uninformed opinions getting laid out. So it's just to kind of give you guys a little bit of more insight into what the actual laws are. You're on mute, Billy. Well, all, I knew I was going to have to do it at some point if I if I brought up somebody else having theirs mic muted. Um, yeah, Scott's disappeared for the second. That the, the interview is actually longer than that. Um, I've managed to see it already. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of carry on just now, and hopefully Scott can bring it back up when he when he joins us again. The referee in performance, Tomo. It seems like we're talking about the ref every week, but I thought this was a particularly bad one. He must have had something on at the bookies for the amount of drop balls. Because I've never seen that amount in a game before. What do you think of his overall performance? Yeah, again, it, it comes down to the... Oh, we'll go with a new, sorry, new section of the podcast where yeah. we have... Oh, no. No. <laughs> I think Scotty's having... I'll be ready and I'll put it up. Sorry about the technical difficulties. That's okay. Think... Well, on, on you go, play it just now, Scott. Thanks. Okay. okay. To give us some refereeing analysis on some of the decisions. Um, Gary, just want to introduce yourself. How are you doing? How are you doing, guys? I'm um, pleased to join the team. I'm Gary. I'm a current SFA ref and linesman. I watch so much football shows and there's so many uninformed or uninformed opinions getting laid out. So it's just to kind of give you guys a little bit of more insight into what the actual laws are. 
And if those laws have been applied properly in games, give you a bit more insight and be a bit more informed in your analysis. Magic, mate. Thank you for coming on board. Um, so the first one I kind of want to break down with is uh, the penalty decision. Um, obviously, I think it's a corner that comes in. Um, John Suter's going up to head the ball. And there appears to be a foul when he's going to head the ball. Do you, is that a penalty to you? In my opinion, yeah. Um, I think it's a penalty. Breaking it down to its absolute basics, it's a smash in the face with a player's arm. So if it happens outside the box, it's a free kick and probably a yellow card all day long. So the fact that it happens in the box and they happen to be cha- challenging for a high ball doesn't really make any difference. If that's coming from a goalkeeper, a uh, goal kick, then you're probably given the exact same sanction, albeit a foul instead of a penalty. But I don't see why there's any mitigation in the fact that they're both going for the ball. For me, I think it's a penalty. I understand why the ref, David Dickinson, hasn't noticed it in real time, because I hard one to notice when this guy's challenging for the ball. But certainly VR's done its job on that one, highlighting it. He's gone to have a second look. He can see it a bit clearer, and he's given the penalty. So in my opinion, yeah, 100% penalty. And then the sort of question becomes, should it be a yellow or red card? So we as refs look at sort of elbows or high arms to the face kind of situations as he using it as a tool or a weapon. So a weapon would be intentional elbows to the face, that kind of thing. You'd be looking at red cards. And this one, I think it's Priantes, um, the boy's name is from Hibs. He's clearly just trying to win the ball. He's using the arm for elevation, but he has caught him. So it's a, a penalty and a yellow card. And I think you had a similar one with some, the exact same player from Hibs earlier in the year against Celtic, actually, when he tried to head of the ball and he's ended up uh, heading Alistair Johnson straight in the face, resulting in a penalty for Celtic that day, and I think that was correct. So, yeah, exact same situation, albeit this time it's the arm instead of the head. Okay, thank you for that. Um, obviously, we'll come on to the, the next part's probably the biggest talking point of the day, it's the, the apartment encroachment. Yeah. What's your take on this overall? Right, so the, co- the so rules around encroachment are quite convoluted and I won't bore you with every possible scenario. But basically with this one, David Marshall's on his line, he's not encroached, so the goalkeeper's taken out of the equation. So it's really just, is it attacking player, i.e. Rangers encroachment, Hibs encroachment, or both? And then you've got to consider, is the goal scored or the goal not scored? And that depends on what the outcome is of his encroachment. So as you can see here, Scott Wright's clearly encroaching at the very back. But there's no other Hibs players on the 18-yard line encroaching. However, within the D, which is still part of the encroachment area, there's a couple of Hibs players got their feet in. I don't know exactly which players it is from this picture, but the boy on the edge of the D at the far side and then the boy at the edge of the D on this side are clearly in the D. So I'd say both teams are encroaching there, in which case the scenario is it's a retake, no matter if Tav scores a penalty or misses it. If it was just Rangers players encroaching, Tav scores, it's a retake. But if Tav misses, it's an indirect free kick, which was given on the day. But personally, I think VR may have missed this. This is just me hypothesising because they're focused on the 18-yard line. And again, Scott Wright's the only one encroaching on that. But they've missed the guys encroaching on the D. I think if Tav scores a penalty and it goes straight in, it probably isn't called up. But because it rebounds direct to right, who gets a rebound, that's why they've sort of looked at it and dug it up, even though it's very minuscule encroachment. But for me, it should have been a retake as both teams are encroaching. All right, okay, okay. Um, There's quite a few dropped balls yesterday. Um, <laughs> what was your take on, on that? Well, I, I don't think I've ever seen so many in one game, to be honest. I think it was about five or six overall, which is a mental amount, even for, when I've been doing games, I think the most I've ever had two or three. Um. So technically, everything that happened following the drop balls was correct. So the sort of general rule is whoever's the last to touch the ball before it hits the ref gets the ball back. So even though the ball's gone directly to the opponent, and it's obvious they're going to pick up possession, you still have to give it back to the team that's last kicked it, which is a massive source of frustration a lot of the time because it doesn't seem in the spirit of the game. But that is the rule. So he's applied it correctly in all those senses. The other one that's a kind of bit of a nuance rule is if the ball's in the box when the play stopped and it's restarted with a drop ball, it automatically goes back to the keeper, regardless of who's in possession. So again, that probably explains, I think, the Tom Lawrence one later on and the one just before half time when I think it's David Marshall goes down with a head knock, 
the ball's given back to him. Now, where I think the ref could have probably used a bit of common sense, match savvy experience, and what I would have done personally is specifically those two I mentioned. The one David Marshall goes down, the Hibs players just blew turn up the park. I think it's close to half time, and they just try to hold on to the, the equalising goal till half time. The ball is about a, a few yards from getting out of play, so the ref delays his whistle by a second. That ball's going out of play for the Rangers throw in. And they can stop the play, let Marshall get the treatment and Rangers get the ball back. There's no player within 30 yards of that ball. So there's no chance of Hibs um, ever going to pick that up. Instead, what he's had to do is restart the game with a drop ball to David Marshall in the box because that's where the play was stopped. And what he should have done, again, he also had the option if the Rangers decide to keep it in, to keep the pressure on, blow the whistle as soon as the Rangers player touches the ball. And then it's a drop ball to Rangers from where the whistle was when the Rangers player picked it up. So he's caused himself a lot of headache there when it didn't really have to be. The one later on, I think it's Chris Cadden who goes down with headlock in the Rangers box. Again, I think he's delayed it. I'm trying try to sort of look at it from his point of view. I think he's delayed it to let Tom Lawrence try and get a first time shot in. Mm -hmm. As soon as Lawrence took a shot and sort of driving towards the area, Chris Cadden's down. He can't let the play continue in case the ball hits off him as a collision with a guy in the deck. So he's got to stop the play. Again, where he could have been a bit savvy is just blow the whistle a, lot, a bit quicker before Lawrence gets into the penalty box, in which case it'd be a drop ball to Rangers on the outside of the box. Because he's waited till Lawrence gets in the box before he blows the whistle, he's got to give the ball back to Marshall. In which case, again, it doesn't. it's in the rules, it's technically correct, but it doesn't seem in the spirit of the game. And I think it's caused a lot of headache. You've seen the Rangers players protesting about it, and he was getting a lot of grief from the stands because of it. Again, using a bit of common sense, blow the whistle quicker, Rangers get the ball back, and people are, at, I think, kick Chris Cadden's at it, whether it is or not, they're not going to grumble too much when Rangers pick up the ball on the edge of the box to restart the game. But because hand the ball straight back to David Marshall, as well considering what's happened earlier in the game, where well, the drop balls, it's just kind of, get, it gave himself a headache that he didn't have to do it, basically. And, but as it goes technically, all of them are correct. As frustrating as that probably sounds, and unfair as it sounds, you know, okay, I mean? that's Scottish football for you. That's oh, listen, I know that maybe people watching this have seen me ref or had me as a ref, and they're thinking, oh, I wish he applied that common sense was he when he was in the middle. But you get caught. The worst thing for a ref is getting caught in the ball, and you get hit by the ball because you just think, whatever direction I run here, I'm stuck. You just get caught in that situation. Sometimes it's horrible, but he stuck to the rules, restarting it, but he can't. It could have been smarter. That's my sort of overall take on it. Hey, right, okay. Well, thank you for coming on, Gary. No worries, mate. And hopefully, it's a wee bit of insight. And I, I could sense the frustration yesterday from the Rangers fans. So hopefully, maybe gives the ref a wee bit of slack, but not too much. Me and the lads will give any panel on it. Um, <laughs> I'll wait and see what you think. And give it our thoughts. All right. Thanks, Paul. No worries. Cheers, Scott. Well, Scott, thanks for doing that. I think it's going to be invaluable uh, having Gary to go over definitely, definitely contentious, contentious decisions. Uh, I was I was talking to you, Tom. So I'll, I'll come back to you. What's your initial thoughts on things that Gary's been saying there? No, I think he's uh, he's explained it pretty well. I think technically, right, Dickinson got, got one correct, but it's just frustrating, especially the one where it was going out for a throw-in, and he just needs to wait a second, a second or two, and then. It's, it's a throw-in rather than giving himself that headache of just having to give the ball back. And same with the Lawrence one. Um, there was a good few seconds before he's blown up there. You know, Cadden's been down, I, I reckon, a good 10 seconds. And then he's worked his way into the box. And then he's blew up, which then gives Hibbs back possession when we've been in a dangerous position. So it's frustrating on the, uh, I'd say, from fans watching that, Whereas, yes, the rules may have been correct, but it's yeah, it just doesn't just didn't look good, to be honest. But as Gary explained it pretty well there, um, yeah, I think it was a, he's done a good job. And Dean, uh, we can go into detail when we're talking about the match um, with you know and, and incorporating what Gary says. But uh, what was your initial reaction to some of those decisions and, and Gary's explanation of them? Now, yesterday, uh, uh, Saturday, sorry, watching the game, I was just constantly, like, 
pinching myself, is this even real? What's happening? Um, but in terms of what Gary's just obviously analysed there and um, articulated for us, it's really, really good because we are surrounded by um, people in different places that don't understand the rules of the rules of the game. So you're kind of maybe perhaps encouraged to think a certain way or react a certain way, things like that. But having somebody who uh, who knows the, the laws of the game inside it come on and, and explain it the way he did is, is actually really good because, yeah, things can get totally not really tangled in terms of what's the law and what's not the law. And uh, I, I like how Gary explained the drop balls because I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, watching the audio, I'm like... Is this even? This is like worse than a, an, an amateur Sunday league game, you know. Um, but yeah, all good. I, I, I really liked um, as we have explaining the the drop balls, especially because yeah, that's it was bizarre. I know, Scott. Are we able to get the uh, the first picture up? Because um, yeah. when you see the the, the kind of flows in play and play and who's in the ascendancy, whatever. Um, I don't know if you actually know if we can see it with our pictures at the bottom, but yeah, thanks, Scott. So, I mean, Rangers, I, I felt that Rangers were in control most of the game, despite Hibs being a bit more adventurous than normally when teams come to iBooks. But you can see in that bottom graphic there that we were had all the kind of chances and, and flow of play. Scott, did you feel that in, in the game itself, or have you watched it back yet? How did you feel? I, I thought it was... Um, I thought Rangers were relentless again, and... Saturday, I've got nothing but compliments for the way teams playing just now. Um, although Hibs had the the period in the match where um, they scored their goal, I mean they they didn't really threaten us. They didn't really get in behind. I thought John Suter was a, an absolute colossus at the back on Saturday. I think the guy would have headed his granny given the opportunity. Um, I like the way Rangers set a tempo. They controlled the match. Overall, it was a just it was just a comfortable performance, Billy. Really. We we played decent football before the penalty, but I would say you might hopefully you, you agree with me that the the penalty was the first major instance in the match. Dean, you did, watching it live, did you see the incident happen? Is it? Um, did you think it was a penalty at the time? <clears throat> yeah, right away. Um, I said that's a penalty um, just because of the exactly what Gary said. I, I thought that in real time, and then. I went away and made myself a cup of tea because I can't be five, ten minutes before the decision <laughs> was given. So, uh, yeah, I uh, still more penalty as the laws of the game. As Gary said, if it's outside the box, it's a free kick. If it's the other way around and it's on the goalkeeper, it's a free kick to the goalkeeper. Doesn't doesn't matter, you know, inside the box, outside the box. That's one thing that really actually, excuse me, pisses me off. You always hear, oh, if it's outside the box, it, well, it should be the same if, on every bloody grass on the pitch. So, yeah, um, still more penalty. And uh, and uh, and did the guy get booked? He got a yellow, it, yeah. Aye, aye. So it's so well the exactly what was meant to happen then. No, I think you're, I think you're right. And, and Tom, is it a penalty for you? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I've got to be honest. In real time, I didn't really see it. No. I was sort of, you know, when when it comes to us having corners, I sort of look away and whatnot because not not a huge amount comes from it. But, um, yeah, I didn't really see it. I just seen Suter on the ground. But as soon as you saw the first replay, it was like, yeah, that's a penalty. There's was, was no doubt about it. And like I say, it goes it goes back to um, anyone who knows anything about football will say it is a penalty. And then there's those who want the rules to uh, be the way they want it to be and uh, say, oh, no, that's not a penalty. It's a coming together or whatever. I don't even know what a coming together means anymore, but... Apparently, yeah, uh, yeah. Some some pundits, it's a coming together, and it's not a penalty. But any anyone, I think, with eyes could see that it's a it's a stone wall penalty. Well, Scott, let's go on to the penalty itself. Tav mm-hmm. misses it. This is the second penalty in a row that he's missed. Time for a change? No, definitely not. I was messaging Kai yesterday about Tav's penalty conversion rate, and I think I think Tav's missed potentially three in his last six which is the same amount of penalties he's missed in the last two seasons, I think Kai told me. But I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be taking them off penalties. The guy scored his important penalties like, countless times, countless times. He's too good a penalty taker to, um, to take off on Billy. 
he just needs to stop listening to his misses in terms of yes. where to put them. <laughs> so I, I actually had to cross a football field this morning during uh, for work, and I stood on the penalty spot. It's actually quite a bit further back than the. Uh, than I thought it was. You, you feel when you're seeing it on TV, you oh, it just has to roll it in, but it's you've got to strike a ball and get it on target. I agree with you, though. He needs to stop listening to, to his misses. Um, I was thinking the last time we tried to change penalty taker when Tab had missed a few, was it Morelos took the one in the cup final? Aye. Aye. Uh, I think it wasn't if you don't mind me coming back in, Billy, on, on the subject, yeah. I think Tavernier, like, stepping not to take a penalty, needs to continue because... Any time we've kind of tried to change it, it's, it's not worked. Yeah. He steps up the way, he strikes the ball. He's just so reliable for his spot, so I wouldn't want it to change. Uh, on to the what happened next was um, Scott Wright with, I thought, really good finish. It's mm-hmm. pretty. It's a shame for him, actually, because um, he was getting much maligned and that would have been a, a, nice, a nice thing for him because the things you hear about him at the club is that he, he's well-liked, he's well-liked by the manager, he, he's a good trainer. It just can't seem to translate that onto consistent performances. Um, I guess our opinion on on this is going to be shaped by what Gary said. That there's more than one player encroaching in that penalty box, and it should have been retaken. Tomo, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, as Gary has said, um, it looks like it could. If VAR is doing the job properly, and by the rules, it should have been retaken. But um, you know, it is what it is. It wasn't given. Um, it was a nice finish from Wright, who I actually thought had a had a pretty decent first half on Saturday. He was uh, lively. He was positive. Um, probably should have scored from a cutback from uh, from Dessers, but uh, his, his finish from the penalty was was nice. And yeah, I wouldn't be taking Tav off penalties. His uh, his technique is second to none, and I think he's just. Tried to outfox a goalkeeper there, thinking he's going to go early and just roll it down the middle, which unfortunately he didn't. I believe he says he chooses before the game even starts where he's going to put any penalties. So if he's chosen to go down the middle again, uh, Dean, are you still happy for for Tav to stay on penalties at the moment? I totally am. Uh, in my opinion, it's a lot of averages in terms of him missing. You know, like nobody on the planet can score. You know, every single penalty, even the best penalty takers in the world, for you know, miss. And Tav scores that many, it's, you know, it's bound to happen. He's bound to get a miss here and there. But as long as the misses don't cost us points and things like that, then, you know, it's fine with me. You know, it, as Scott touched on, they're just going to echo what he said. Steps up in big, big moments with all that pressure on his shoulders and puts the ball away time and time again. So, aye, I've done, you know... I've, I've got no qualms about him, you know, going into a rut of, like, being taken off penalties and that. It would just, it would just be, the dynamics would just be wrong, in my opinion. Um, and we, what obviously they meant when he happened, Scott Wright, I was actually so pleased for him that he scored. And and if you actually look at the goal, I kind of never got, got disallowed, but great, great technique. I'm aware of way to put the ball at the angle that he was at. It was a great goal and you saw how much it meant to him. Last week I touched on about the players stepping up and, you know, the title run and, like, everybody, you know, needing to play their part. And I was like, that's, you know, that's that, that's him stepping up. And, you know, actually, I'm one of his biggest critics and I was really disappointed for him that the that ended up being disallowed because of encroachment. Um, but the going back on the encroachment, I think that there's a... There's, we, we don't need to get ourselves, you know, encouraged that that's going to be the case from now because there's no consistency. There hasn't been consistency with the officiating for as long as I can remember. And if the VAR has missed the Hibs players' encroachment, then then they need to really reevaluate their, their, you know, go and get their eyes tested because it's, it's clear as day. You, you can see it. It's not as if they're hidden by something. It's clear as day that the Hibs players were in the D, so... Yeah, um, that was just, it just pissed me off that, you know, like, typically against uh, for us, but aye, we won the game and that's all that matters. <laughs> I just can't remember the last time I've seen a penalty being chopped off with encroachment. It's not something that no. is regularly, regularly happens. I remember, but, uh, I remember last year, Billy, when we played Napoli at Ibrox, they, 
Yeah. Took a penalty. McGregor saved it. The Napoli player stuck the ball in the net. And I think it was one of their players that was in the box. Um and it was yeah, it was a retake from what I recall. And I think I can't remember if he scored it or McGregor saved it again. McGregor but, not saved yeah, it. I think he might have done. I think he yeah. might have saved it. But that that that's the last time I've seen like a, a penalty disallowed for encroachment. And just to come back in there, Billy, um yep. every single penalty that I've watched doesn't matter what league it's in. There's encroachment, I think, in every single penalty. Every single penalty gets taken. Um, there's the keepers maybe off his line. There's somebody, you know, in the box or do you know what I mean? Like, and it's been happening for as long as ever. So, uh, it doesn't like that. That type of encroachment has got no real outcome on actually what happened because if Scott Knight was ten centimeters back, he still would have scored the goal. Do you get what I mean? So, yeah, it's not as it's not as if his incredibly minute encroachment put him in a in a better position to score that goal. I've this comment there by by Andy um, asking if both teams encroached, if someone other than Wright scored, would it be retaken? I've just got to defer back to what Gary said and, and Gary saying it should have been retaken by the laws of the game. I know there was a comment about Super Scoreboard mentioning because he, he was the one that scored. That's why it wasn't retaken. But that, that, from my br- brief reading of the rules, which I probably all did on Saturday afternoon, that doesn't seem to come into it. Is, is it encroachment? Who did it? What was the result? And um, both teams are encroaching, so for me it's a, it's a retake. Have you got any more to say on the penalty, Scott? See if it's... I'll, I'll, I'll throw one back at you on it, Billy. See if... Right, so when Wright's running up to Bowen before he hits his shot, Hibs player makes a sliding challenge but he blocked the shot, right, that's coming. So if the Hibs player blocks a shot and the ball goes out for a corner, what is it? Is that a corner? Is that a retake? You know <laughs> uh, I mean? Can we get can we get Gary back on? <laughs> so what Gary says, like by by the kind of rules of the law, if we're sticking to the letter of the law, then we need to go go on that the Hibs player was encroaching in the D area just at the edge of the box. So it's a retake no matter what harms. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So to me that's that's the end of it. And if Super scoreboard are saying that that's that's fine, that's that's their prerogative, that's that's entirely up to them. But I'm gonna stick with what I've been told on it. Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna sit here and make, you know pretend I know all the all the rules of it. I'll just have to defer to someone who at least is trained trained in it. Um I want to move on because quite a momentous occasion happens uh, not too long after. We do get a goal. I think it's Lundstrom puts in a, a lovely cross, and then Tav does what Tav does. Scores 131 goals as a defender, a UK record. I uh, was out on Sunday morning in the car. I had Talk Sport on, which I don't normally do, but I had it on. And uh, the presenter, to his credit, like, brought up that Tavernier has now got the British record for a defender scoring. And the other guy that was on with him said, Oh, I'd like to know how many of them were penalties. See, I keep forgetting the penalties don't count. That's the that's that's the thing. Like he just gets written off because he, he takes our penalties for us. Then the goal itself, I thought it was a screamer. What about you? Hit it sweet as a nut, didn't he? Absolute yeah. peach. Um, can you hit any better? And when when it was coming, and you like we like, you know we watched the goal, but I watched five and I was like, this he's going to hit it and it's going to go in. Do you know it was one of them? You could just his 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 body was in the right position. The ball was coming at the right pace. As you just touched on there, he's got the best. Well, he's probably got the best technique in the club, hasn't he? And and the ball just came, and oh, I, what a goal and what a moment for him! So happy for him, brilliant. Yeah, Tomo, do you see it coming? Yeah, I mean, he scored so many goals similar to that, where he's arriving late and his tech, as I say, his technique is second to none. You just knew he was getting a getting a good strike away there, and he's kept it low into players. And uh, yeah, pass the keeper and the boy in the line. But um, yeah, the, per- the person he's took the record from, uh, Graham Alexander, I think he scored something about 70, 70 odd penalties for Burnley. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, no one ever mentions that, you know, but because, because it's Tav, because he plays for Rangers, all oh, penalties. But like you say, he's still got to score them. Um, and it, it doesn't matter. The, the stats of 131 goals. I mean, I think he's got another 127 assists 
it's just absolutely phenomenal. Doesn't doesn't matter what level of professional football you're playing. That is, you know, that's just unbelievable. There's strikers that go through their career that don't have those sort of stats, and uh, yeah, really, really happy for him. He's he's obviously been at the club for a good number of years now. Captains us, stepped up when it's needed, and just going back to the penalty things as well. Um, we get a penalty next week in the 95th minute. There's no one else that wants stepping up to take it. Mm-hmm. If I'm being honest, he's a, you know, he's he's the one who we can rely on. I think and. Yeah, happy for him. Happy for him to get that record, and especially so soon after missing a penalty, just shows the type of character he is. Could have hidden, but now he's up there getting on the end of a cross from the left wing. So all credit to him. And Scott, do you agree? I think Goldson was the one that was saying we're not going to appreciate Tav until he's gone. Do you agree with him? Aye, definitely, definitely. James Tav on the year, I would say he's maybe get. In terms of maintaining numbers and consistency and performances, he's got next season, then I would say he starts to kind of tail off. I wouldn't sell him to Saudi because moments like his free kick at Kilmarnock, the League Cup winner, um, you know, free kicks against Dundee United in the 55 season, goals in the semi final of Europa League, goals in the, against Dortmund in the Europa League, the list's endless, it's completely countless. I sat in a gallant view at the start of the season, I actually questioned his captaincy. And I'm sorry I've done it. He shot me up yet again this season. Um, his leadership's unrivaled. His contribution to the club is amazing. I, there's certain aspects of the captaincy I wish he would do differently, but overall, I don't want to have going anywhere. I would, I would like to have to stay for as long as he can. In how you kind of, how you kind of work to have in terms of towards his end of his careers. No, I, I wouldn't say it's a conversation for just now. I would just keep on as long as you can because his influence is his influence is average to none and he's a good player and I just hope that he um he's involved in the process of either getting his replacement in or training the next replacement because there hasn't really been anybody that's out of my guest Patterson but we, we had to cash in on him when we got the offer well, but... funnily enough there's time for a wee, there's time for a wee blog here I interviewed uh, there's a Motherwell blogger called uh, Gogsy I interviewed him earlier on the night. I interviewed him going out on Thursday at lunchtime at half past 12, I think. He actually gives us a lot of good insight into Adam Devine. So everybody should kind of tune on that and then make their mind up because it is worth a watching. I don't mind the shameless plug, Scott. Don't, don't worry about it. You can mention any other pods you've done. G- moving on, because we kind of have to at some point, um, Hibbs equaliser, for me, it's a complete nonsense. Run it down, run it by me. Uh, Tom, what do you think of the whole thing? Yeah, it's come from us, I think, just trying to force the play on the edge of a box. And then within a couple of passes, Hibs are up in our box. I don't know where the midfield had gone. Uh, Lundstrom's left with, uh, I think it was Johan, who's uh, probably Hibs' quickest, dangerous player. And then the defence overall just doesn't cover itself in glory, really. Um, Stuter sells himself a bit easy. Goldson sells himself. Tav maybe wrong side of him. Butland, not going to criticise him too much, but could he have been off his line a little bit quicker? Maybe. But the, the whole thing from start to finish just wasn't wasn't a good... No goals are good to lose, but, you know, they've not really cut us open. They've It's not been too much hard work for Hibs, really. And uh, the, the way we'd played that first half, there'd been a couple of little little snippets of Hibs that we could do that in that first half. If we've overloaded men in the box, they were quick on the counter-attack or give them that. And, uh, yeah, you could possibly see it of coming. But uh, I thought, as I say, defensively as a team, didn't cover ourselves in glory at all. Scotty, I'll come back to you. Um, we just praised Tav, but I've got to say a lot of this goes down to him. He did have an opportunity to either interfere with the play or bring the player down on the halfway line. Are you for behaviour like that? Um, Taking the yellow? I feel as if a professional foul needs to be made to benefit a team in the result, then I 100%. We we're not going to get all these decisions right. We're going to... Some of the players are going to get them wrong. They're only human at the end of the day, but okay, that, is, that is what it is. And Hib's, got, Hib's got their one goal against us this season, but I thought... Uh, Talking about set pieces, I thought Hibbs set piece in the first half at the beginning of the match was probably the best one of the game. 
when he goes to play ball at the park and that's showing you <laughs> only face and it bounces back and knocks the other player out. I was wondering what you were talking about there. Aye, Pat McAfee off the WWE, he's a wrestling commentator. He even retweeted that and says, is this real? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Three million followers. O- only in Scottish football would you see something like that. It's the most Hibs thing ever happens to Hibs. Um... I, think they got a, I think they got a drop ball for it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, I'll come, come to you on... Um... That you, I should say, Tom, you must have read my notes because I've got that. Like, Tav needs to deal with the halfway line. Suter sold a dummy. Tav and Golson not strong enough in the box, and, and Butlin not quick enough off his line. Is any of that? And, and Lundstrom's actually just wandering. He's just strolling. He's not chasing the ball back. About he's just walking. What? I was trying to think what I was going to say there. You, are we wrong in any of these criticisms, Dean? No, and one criticism that you've left out is Barisic now. Barisic mm-hmm. actually actually speeds up when Tav comes over and he's, he's defending ball at the halfway line. Barisic kind of speeds up, but then slows down and just starts jogging. Like, burst their gut and get back. Like, I, I, honestly, I can't stand him, really. Like, seriously, <laughs> just burst their gut and get back, man. You're, you know, you're a defender. If you actually watch, I've watched about four or five times to make sure that what I'm seeing is actually right. And that's what he does. And because uh, obviously lunch from his life back and the space between Suter and Goldson is just is ridiculous. You never see that. You know, that's a very, very unique and, you know, a bit of an enigma about our defence because Goldson and Suter are usually quite, you know, close together when we're defending as obviously as a unit. And Lundstrom's filling in at life back and he gets, you know, looks like he's got two left feet. And But the boy does play a good pass in, and um, it's like... It's, Got to give Hibs credit because it was actually a good goal and uh, boys showed good composure in the box and everything like that. Yeah, every single part of the Rangers side of things should and could have been better. Um, but yeah, um, I'd have, it was just it was just a, one of those really crap goals to give away. And but as I say, got to give Hibs credit. As Scott said, they've scored their one goal against us, so um, that but women enjoy that. Can I, can, I, can I just jump in there as well? Um, one of, uh, I think it was RFC 56, made a comment there about Barisic not giving it to Dio Mandy quick enough. And uh, yeah, he was spot on. I was sitting there watching it on the telly and Dio Mandy was there screaming for the ball yeah. in a load of space. And Barisic just held on to it, held on to it. And then when he did play it to him, whatever Dio Mandy was in looking for afterwards had been sort of closed down. So that was a frustrating part of our play at times as well. Just when we slow it down and we let Hibs get mm. back in, get back in and uh, get in their shape. It does feel like th- that was the one shot on target. Same with Motherwell game. They had two shots on target, scores, score two goals. It seems like when we, we do make a, a mistake like that or we do, we are slack, every team's punishing us. It might just, that might just be based on these two games, but that's how I feel like any time... A team scores against us, it's the one and only chance in the match or one of two chances in the match or whatever. Um, Scott, is, is this a, an inherent problem or is it just an anomaly? Um, I think it's just an anomaly, to be honest with you, Billy. Uh, um, in terms of Barisic, Barisic can't play on Sunday. <laughs> I watched Celtic's right winger yesterday, cuts on his left hand side. As soon as he cuts in on Borna, Borna's done. Bonner's right. absolutely done. He does, he's not got a he's not got a the yard of pace he used to have if he's ever had it. He's um doesn't really offer much going forward, don't get me wrong. He was I'm not going to sit and criticise him. I thought he was okay on um Saturday, but I wouldn't trust him in a big match for the end of the season. Hmm. Well, we went behind or we went on level two, I'm sorry for long, because a few minutes later we get Cyril Dessers channeling the spirit of Mark Hately with a really fantastic head. In fact, all the goals in the, all, all goals in this game probably would normally win goal of the match um, up until the very last one, which I think takes the biscuit. But this is a great cross in from uh, Cantwell and a great finish. And he is much maligned, Scott, by yourself mm-hmm. more than a lot of people. But that's a good finish by Dessers. Aye, definitely. That's what I was saying. I thought Dessers set a tone on Saturday. He'd done everything I would want. My Rangers number nine, number nine today. He was probably man of the match. 
say there's a close argument between him and Tav there. Tav comes up, does has his captain's moment, scores a goal to get his flying. Um, Dessel scores a goal to put his ahead <coughs> just before half time. But my, my question about Cyril Dessel is can he, has he done it over a 60 game season? We need to look at it at the end of the season and then really judge him. Do you know what I mean? He's, he, has, he has these games, especially against Tibbs. It's his third goal against Tibbs, and everybody thinks, all right, aye, he's brilliant, aye, he's people know for a character game. But is he going to do it against Celtic on Sunday? <laughs> that's that's the kind of that's where he needs to do it. That's where he needs to earn his, uh, his money. Um, he needs to score a goals to win his league. And even if he manages to do that, I'm still, I still don't know if I'm going to be convinced because he's sluggish starting with this season. No, I, mean, I think I think it's fair enough. Tom, I feel like when he has time to think about something, he doesn't do too well. But when he's just able to come onto a ball like that, he scores more often than not. Do you agree with that or you you think it's more nuanced? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think he's a very instinctive striker. And the, the, the cross in from Cantwell was just unreal. It was just begging. It was just begging for someone to be on the end of that. Um but yeah, no, I think he is an instinctive striker. Um, but I thought on Saturday was probably his best game we've seen from him in terms of his his all round game, um, holding the ball up, bringing others into play, making runs into the channels. Um, yeah, I, I thought he had a I thought he had a very good game, and I think Campwell, he, he's coming back in getting minutes. I don't think he was at his best on on Saturday, but like I say, the the cross that he put in, he's he's capable of that, and that's why he's in the team. But uh, yeah, it was a brilliant goal, especially so soon, having conceded that. And you go back to the Motherwell game; they, they score with their one shot, heads can go down, but we just went straight up the park, got that second goal, and then it was never really in doubt after that. Scott, can I come back to you? You have something to say? Aye, aye. It's just uh, back on Tomo's point about Dessers. Tomo, I agree with you in terms of it's probably his best game in a Rangers shot. But what? Was it about 31 games into the season now? We're out of Europe. Yeah. We're top competition. How many matches is it taking for to get our performance out of you? Do you know what I mean? Like, this is Have you got the heat map there for him, Scott, is to see again? It was in that, yeah. that other slide. Aye. Oh, that's dear man day. I don't know. It's just on the first one, yeah. Um, so you can see, I mean, he's he's in the box mm-hmm. for most most of the game. That, that's where you kind of want your Rangers number nine, isn't it? Hundred percent, I I hundred percent. But what I'm trying to get at is, it's taken all this time to get a performance that we should be getting most weeks out of him. Do you know what I mean? That's that's where my bugbear lies with the guys. He's far too inconsistent, and it costs over half a million pound, which is not which is not a, a small amount of money for Rangers to be paying on on a striker. I, I agree with and for for me it's that that amount of money in his age because we're mm-hmm. not really going to get anything but we're lucky to get our money back for him never mind getting any kind of profit. Um, Dean, did I, did I come to you on the goal? What was your thoughts on on that goal? It was it was a brilliant goal. Cross was on a sixpence for him. Ah, he's um, he's scored a header that you would expect your number 90 score, but I really was, you know, encouraged by his reaction because before when he's had criticism, he's kind of like, maybe went like that or, you know, you know, and like that, but his, his, his reaction was, he actually saw how much that goal meant to him and which is obviously really good for his confidence, but to be devil's advocate, he should have had a hat trick. Um, mm. And, and, uh, you know, your Rangers number nine, you want them to be having a hat trick with the with the chances that he had yesterday, but we won and that's and that's the most important thing. But um and it was a good goal. I mean the Crosby Canyon was, you know, it was uh, brilliant. Um so and then the, the chances that he missed them, you know, just like, well, at least we won the game. But he has to he has to, you know, have better a, a better conversion rate than he does, and against Celtic, he's he's maybe not going to get as many chances as he does against Hibs. And can we rely on him to put the ball away when we need them to get the three points? That's a big question. And going in, um, going in at half time is having losing a, a, an injury time goal is a lot different than going in having just put yourself up, isn't it, Scott? Aye, definitely, definitely, 100%. for both teams. I mean. 
Yeah, yeah. It, um, it changed the, the complexion of the match. It kind of it would have conf- maybe confused come on to it, to, if I'm being honest, in terms of his half-time team talk. Mm-hmm. Um, goal came at a really, really good time. And you know what? We, we deserved to go, in a, to go in ahead. The goal we gave away was sloppy and I thought the pass for Cantwell for Desert's goal was, was was a peach, to be brutally honest. He's a good, just a good old-fashioned cross. It was brilliant. Mm. Um, there was a lot of pace in the ball. Desert just had to meet it in the air, running onto the ball. It was just a good good overall goal. It, set, it settled any kind of anxiety that might have come in there had we get in one each half thing. Yep. I, I had no doubt we were, we were winning that match anyway. I was surprised how quickly obviously we responded. But going into the second half, uh, Tomo, I felt the second half kind of went a bit flat because I was expecting us to come flying out the charts. We've just scored. Let's go and put them to the sword kind of thing. But um, it kind of went a bit kind of stale for a wee bit. Yeah, I mean, to, to be fair to him, Hibs came out and, and tried to have a go at us. And I would say probably for the first 10, 15 minutes of the second half, they were probably the better, better side in terms of you know, getting forward, trying to make things happen. And then we made some uh, we made some substitutions. Campwell was looking a bit leggy. We obviously got Seema back. Um, Matondos came on. And then we sort of stamped ourselves back on the game and just it was getting to a point where we were just seeing it out, really, um, without too much drama. And then Matondo pops up. But um, I don't think we were in any major danger that second half, even when even when Hibs were having a fair bit of the ball and getting into our box. I don't really think we created much. It was a bit huffing and puffing and not not being able to blow the door down really. Um, but as Scott, as you said, Billy, um, there was at no point really I was worrying that we were going to drop any points there on Saturday. All three goals for me, Dean, were. Were really good goals, really good finishes, but I think obviously Matondo's finish there is takes the cake. It's world class for me. He could have maybe even got a penalty just um, a few seconds before if he'd, um, but he had one one mind, and that was to put the ball in that that far corner. Aye, it's uh, good to see that that was that was his you know intention that he wanted to score that type of goal. And I wouldn't be surprised if it gets goal of the month for the. For March, it was um, ah, it was absolutely sweet as a nut again. Um, glad for him as well to, to get the goal, like you know, and so how much it meant to him. So hopefully he can contribute in the in the title race, same um, because we need those types of players to score those types of goals. It's really it's, it's been it's been a while since we've been able to enjoy goals like that. Isn't it? Um, know. You know, three three good goals, really, really good goals in, in a game. It's, it's, they're usually maybe few and far between, but yeah, um, well done, Rabi. And Scott, you you, you, uh, you are harsh and Dessers, but you, what are you, what's your feelings on Matondo next season, going forward? Um, I would probably say, I, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard. Um, do we take? I'll, I'll ask you a question, by one of Billy. Do you take mm-hmm. uh, Seema or Cortez over Matondo if we need to sell Matondo to get one? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. You know what I mean? Um, I think Matondo would be a good squad player, but I also think Matondo needs to be a guy that's starting every week. I think he's mm-hmm. very much a confidence player. I think. Can you remember how much he cost? Three million. Right, so it's not. Okay. Yeah, it's not nothing. I think. Personally, for me, um, he's had a good contribution since January. I mean, when Dessers, Dessers, sorry, same, when Seema initially got injured, um, I think Matondo stepped into his boots fairly well. Mm. He was contributing by a goal or an assist every other match. He was playing good football and then he picked the injury up. Now he's come back in and he's starting to show kind of similar signs. So I think it's, it's very much he's in the same boat as Scott Wright. Now, don't jump on me when I say that. I'm... I mean, he's in the same boat as in. He needs a run of games. He needs a lot of confidence. He's in that kind of area, whereas Scott Wright's been here a lot longer than Matondo. I think where, that's where I'm trying to kind of settle on. Is he going to get, because you've probably got Seema and um, Silva on the left. He's not shown much on the right-hand side. Is he going to get a chance to get those run of games on the left, do you think? Um, I would start him on Sunday. 
I would really? Start, like, mm-hmm. Or okay. bring him on with 10, 15 minutes left because I think Celtic's right back. I think if we've got a winger that can beat a player there, I think Matondo's got to beat him. Beating him, to be honest. I think um, just he came on in Saturday and looked as if he all of a sudden developed a really good like, low centre of gravity. I mean, the ball kind of stuck to his feet, skipped it by um, Hibs, Hibs defender and then just bent it into the right. Like, uh, 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 right, just an inside the right hand post, and it was a really sweet finish to be honest with you. So he's definitely gave a manager something to think about. But now that I've now that I've said it, I don't know who I would go with in terms of Silva Matondo. But in terms of impact, I would probably start with Matondo. But Silva could still do a job, no bother. It's difficult to it's difficult to say. It, it, uh, um... Yeah, it is the fast boy we're debating it, I suppose. But you know, get you get these intrusive thoughts, and sometimes you think a player's better than they actually are, and you think they should start against Celtic next week. But I don't, I don't imagine that he will. But we can talk about that in another in a preview pod. Um, I feel the referees got off lightly, despite us talking about him earlier on in the game. So I'd like to bash him a wee bit more, Scott. The overall, how do we improve the standard of refereeing? Your um, opinion? I don't know. I don't know. There's obviously me and Gary kind of had a quick chat about whether they would make like, full time, but then it get pointed out to me these guys have all got full time jobs. That are, you know, it's we don't we didn't ever, we came to a conclusion that we didn't really see much difference getting made to it. Whether you make them full time, it's the obvious answer, but is it really going to make a difference on human error? I mean, we've even got a machine, we've even got video evidence that's supposed to help them. And that's still not getting used properly. So I think I think a full review needs done on it, if I'm being brutally honest, because the amount of mistakes are, are just a joke. But as David Johnson once said, it, like, these things all even themselves out over the course of a season. And I've always believed that. I've always believed it without, with or without VAR that there's no conspiracy theories. I don't think they'll there's ever been. I don't think these guys are coming into referee Rangers as a Rangers or a Celtic support and that's influencing their decisions. I just don't believe it. Um, I just think it's human error that causes it, to be brutally honest with you. It's a, it's a really tough and kind of delicate subject to delve into without getting slated, to be honest with you, Billy. Well, um, Tom, the, I don't know if you watch rugby. I watch the Six Nations, but they have very kind of open... You can hear what the bar team are, are saying to the referee. Would we benefit from that, do you think? I think the fans would definitely benefit from it. Um, there's nothing more frustrating, obviously, than being in a stadium and not knowing what's going on. And just hearing how they get to their get to the conclusion, get to their decisions. You might not agree with it, but at least you uh at least you hear the thought, thought processes and, and why we're doing what we're doing. And just going back to the full time thing, I don't think that would make any difference. Um, referees in England are full time, and every week they're, they're getting a sl- they're getting a slating as well for things. Um, I, I agree with Scott. I don't think there's any sort of conspiracy against Rangers or anything like that. No. But I do think there's a lot of I do think there's a lot of pressure put on referees by certain pundits and people in the media that maybe make referees have a little think about awarding Rangers certain decisions. You know, it has to be stonewall before we get it, not just a little, oh, it could be this, it could be that, you know. I think it has to be, and, and we've seen it with like the penalty up at St. Johnston, stonewall penalty, referee looking straight at it, doesn't want to know until obviously VAR jumps in, but... I think what Gary was saying earlier, whether we like it or not, the referee pretty much got most things right on Saturday. We we just might not like it, and I think that's what I think that's what fans need to start accepting. These guys do know the rules more than we do, and I think we need to just accept sometimes that. Just because we don't like the decision doesn't mean it's wrong, if, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, fair enough. Well, then, unless you've got anything else to say about referees, just a quick thing, a quick feeling on your confidence going into the old firm game next week. How, how are you feeling about it? 
Um, I've got a bit of the referees, so I'll tell, tell you about that quickly. Go, go. Um, I, I've, I've said for years that the referees need to come from maybe even like Wales and have no have no affiliation, no connection to any team whatsoever and come and referee our game. I've said that for years because I think we were on the great point, I think, on the pod on Friday. Um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody had said about there being too many teams in Scotland for the size of the nation that we are maybe. Um, and I think a lot of referees are obviously going to be connected to one club one way or another without naming any. But And there's been previous referees in the past who, when it's came to Rangers, and they've, and they've been like like instantaneous, pulling cards out and things like that, or, or whistling, you know, without any thought into the decision-making. So that's just my, my piece on that. Confidence going into... Um, the old firm is I'm really confident. As I said the other day, the we needed we needed a, a win to and you know, a come but the way the way that we won, the manner that we won was was how I wanted us to win and we did. And going into Ibrox, knowing that, you know, we're to win the game we go we go ahead and we lay a marker down for the you know, the, the business end of the season. I believe that irrespective of what team Clermont picks, that we will get the three points. I'm I'm confident of that. And and Tomo, the next two games could kind of set us up for a really interesting end of the season. Are you confident going into these games? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, going in against Celtic, I'm always confident going in against them. Um I think we I think we have got a better team than them. I'm not gonna lie. It's just whether we we click on the day and we put away our chances when we get them, that's what's been missing. The, the last few old firm games, they've took their chances, we haven't, and that's been the difference. So, yeah, and then Dundee on Wednesday night after that, hopefully all being well, we're, we're five points clear going into the split in a very, very strong position then. But, uh, you know, it's that old cliche one game at a time, so... Get Sunday out of the way and then sort out Dundee after that. But no, I'm confident for both two games that we're going to get six points. Good. And, and Scott, yourself? Um, we're due to beat them. We're definitely due to beat them. Um, we need to beat them. I kind of sat and thought about what fixtures after the international break. And I sat and thought if we can win with four fixtures when we come back, the league is close. I'm not saying it's one, it's close, because we'd be five clear um, going into. I mean, you've got potentially Dundee and Hearts away in a split, and then the other, oh, sorry, no, the Dundee, Hearts and Celtic away, and then another two at home. We've beat Hearts at Tynecastle already. We can beat Dundee at Tynecastle. Celtic game will take care of itself um, when you're two home ties. It's, it's up in the air, and I'm trying not to... I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. I'm trying to stay quite balanced, but but what I'm trying to get at is won some position if we do win on Saturday and then managed to dispose of Dundee and Ross County. I think the Dundee game being postponed is going to be a, a blessing in disguise because I think if you look at it with a wee bit of perspective, if we played that after playing Benfica, considering how leggy we were, there was a chance we could have dropped points against them, mm. considering how tired we were. Um... So I am I'm quietly confident about Sunday because the only difference in the two teams and the two matches this season has been Kyogo for Hashi. So that's why we need one number nine to step up. Fair enough. Well, look, thanks everybody for coming on. I want to thank Gary um, for his input on the referee inside. Hopefully we can go back to him for other decisions in the future because it was good to hear from him. Um, Scotty, thanks for coming on, mate. No, thanks for having me, mate. Thanks for having me. And Tomo, yourself, thank you for coming on again. No, again, always a pre- uh, always a pleasure, Billy. And uh, yeah, looking forward to Sunday. Hope it's uh, hope we get the right result, and we're we're happy next Monday. And it's a it's a it's a good podcast to listen to next Monday night. Yeah, Dino, you know, I'm I'm hoping that you're going to be happy next Monday as well. Thanks for coming yes. on. No, thanks for having me. Pleasure and privilege as always, mate. Bye.
I'm smiling because I'm, 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 I've got a good feeling that I'll be as happy, oh, happier on Monday. <laughs> yes, well, thank you everybody in the comments. Uh, it's good to read along. Thank you everybody for listening. Please like and share and tell your friends about us if you enjoy us. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.